Hey guys, it's Steve. Hope everybody's doing all right this morning. Uh, it's Palm Sunday, the week before Easter. Great time to celebrate our Lord and Savior Jesus. Hope this finds everyone doing well this morning. Uh, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 19 is where we're going to spend the majority of our time this morning. It's great to be with you all once again. I uh, hope you're enjoying uh, the messages. I just want to say thank you once again to those of you that tune in uh, every week to hear the message. Uh, definitely uh, getting great response, which I'm really, really humbled by, grateful for. Um, if you are viewing this uh, through YouTube, I just want to encourage you to uh, uh, subscribe to my page and to uh, feel free to put comments uh, in the comment section, uh, lets me know what's helping you, what needs uh, to be improved, all those kind of things. Uh, I've thought for a long time about, in addition to uh, messages online, as far as sermons, also doing uh, a weekly blog, maybe eventually leading into uh, a vlog, um, some video, weekly video chats, things like that. So let me know if you'd be interested in some of that. Uh, your, your input is always uh, greatly appreciated and needed. So just wanted to uh, put that before you um, this morning before we start as well. The message this morning is going to be called, Where is Your Heart? Where is your heart? Of course, actually, we could ask ourselves that every single week, every single day. Uh, several times a day, if we're being honest, but where is your heart right now? And then we're going to dig into where were the heart of those uh, that were lining the streets of Jerusalem uh, as he entered the streets um, a week before Easter. So uh, we're going to take a close look at that uh, today, and we'll go from there. But let's let's bow our heads and pray together before we get started, shall we? Father, good morning. Thank you for waking us all up today. Um, you've, you've waken us up. That means you must have some wonderful plans for us. And Father, we don't want to miss what those plans are. Uh, life is, is challenging right now, and we know that you know that. We know that we're not alone. Father, we are so grateful that you are by our side and holding our hands and just with us no matter what season of life we're in. We do pray for those that are struggling right now, which are a lot of people, God. We mourn with all the many people that are grieving the loss of loved ones right now, God. We pray for our families. We pray for uh, the workforce. We pray for uh, the United States, but not just the United States, God. We pray for the whole world. We pray for government leaders. Um, Father, we just want to tell you we need you, we love you, and we welcome your intervention down here. Thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for his sacrifice. Thank you so much for his example. Help us to all be a little more like him today. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so, like I was saying, we're going to start in Luke 19. Um, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem is actually recorded in all four of the uh, Gospels. Um, but we're going to read it in, in Luke's account. Um, just by the way, uh, obviously next week is Easter. And because of the uh, shutdown orders in many of the places around the country... Churches are not gathering like they traditionally do for Easter, but I got good news for you. We're still going to celebrate Easter. We're still going to celebrate the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, because that's what we do, right? Uh, we don't need a, a building uh, to celebrate Him. It's about what's going on in our heart, and we definitely want to celebrate that the tomb is still empty, and our Jesus is still reigning. Amen. Luke 19, let's start in verse 28 together. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. 
untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those, were, those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to, to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Now I want to look at this passage and see the attitude change that takes place with the people. You see, people are welcoming Jesus into their town and into their life. And days later, many are yelling, crucify him and choosing a criminal to be released instead of him. What changed? Did anything change? Well, Jesus is heading toward Jerusalem, right? He passes through the Mount of Olives, which days later, he will be crying out to God to take the burden of the cross from him. Jesus rides into Jerusalem to the praises and the blessings of the people who wanted him to be their king. But the Pharisees, they didn't like him. And they knew scriptures well. They knew that he needed to ride into Jerusalem for prophecy to be fulfilled. And they were telling Jesus to shut his disciples up. Jesus rebukes them back, says if they kept quiet, that even the rocks would cry out and praise God because of what was about to happen. Well, what is happening? Well, we'll pick up our first point there. And it comes in the form of a question. Why the attitude change days later? Why the attitude change days later? You know, I know a lot of people know about the cross. I know a lot of people understands what it symbolizes. I know a lot of people have heard about Jesus, but few have experienced the transformational power of a personal encounter with the risen Jesus Christ. Because when you have a personal encounter with the risen Jesus Christ, you cannot walk back to your life the same. You will be forever changed if you have a true encounter with the Jesus Christ that we know. But to many others, Easter is about tradition. Easter is about going to a building. Easter is about dressing up in your Sunday's finest. Easter is about Easter egg hunts. Easter, egg, Easter is about the food, the candy, family gathering, photographs. But to those that are truly following Jesus, we know that it's much, much deeper than those things, right? Palm Sunday begins a journey of our Savior I shouldn't say a beginning, but it's, it's climaxing towards the last days of Jesus' three-year ministry 
where he's going to eventually go to the cross. We're, we're days away from that at this point. A lot can happen in one week. A lot can happen in a few days. Why did the attitude of the people of Israel change in one week? Well, I think it's the same reason that people today follow Jesus for a while and then decide to stop following Him. I think, though I don't understand in totality, I think I understand a pretty good picture of why that is. And I think you do too. See, Jesus, very much compassion, very much loving, very much full of grace, no mistake about it. Jesus came to change us. Jesus died so we could be transformed. Jesus died so we could become more like him. He doesn't say what we want him to say all the time, does he? Jesus, through righteous love, demands that we change. Yes, he meets us where we're at, but he also expects us to grow. He also is, expects us to follow him the rest of our days. The people wanted Jesus to do what they wanted him to do. How often are we like that? Everything's going fine with Jesus as long as he's answering my personal prayers, as long as he's seeing things the way I see. Wow, we got to be careful with our hearts, don't we? It's about following Him. It's about obeying Him. It's about loving Him. It's about surrender to Him. The people wanted a king to change their situation and not mess with the junk that's going on in their hearts. And we can be like that too, right? Jesus, I don't want you in here. You don't want to see in there. I don't want you to see in there. Well, you know what? He already knows. And he wants to prune it out. He wants to eradicate it. Because that's how we're going to be more like him, is if we get that nasty stuff out of there. Make no mistake, Jesus will get in the messy business of our hearts. We got to let him, though. We got to let him do the work he needs to do. The people wanted military muscle. They wanted Jesus to overtake the Roman Empire. They thought that Jesus was going to come by force. They knew Jesus had the power to overtake the evil Roman Empire. Jesus was going to save them. They wanted a king. They wanted a physical king. They wanted a violent king, if we're being honest. And that's not the way Jesus came. That's not what he came for. Jesus wanted to be a savior. Jesus wanted the Romans saved. He loved them just as much as he loved the Israelites. You see, the Israelites wanted Jesus to change Rome. But Jesus wanted to change their hearts. Jesus wants to change my heart. Jesus wants to change your heart. They wanted power given back to them that the Romans had stolen. Jesus wanted peace. They saw the Romans as the problem. Jesus said, no, you're the problem. Your heart's the problem. And I know that sounds harsh, but it's really not. Jesus loves us enough to speak the truth in love. I can look at myself honestly and say, I'm my own worst enemy. I get in my way. I'm my biggest problem. I'm my biggest obstacle. My pride, my sin, my shortcomings. We've all got it. And yes, there's grace, but not to be abused, but to turn us away from sin. Amen? Make no mistake, coming to Christ is a radical change because He's going to do some radical change in us. 
So that leads me to my second point, which is also in the form of a question. What went wrong? What went wrong? Well, for them, they looked for what Jesus could do for them instead of seeing what it was all about. For us, it's not that much different. It's creating a Jesus to our liking instead of seeing who he was and what he did and how he sacrificed. You see, Jesus knows everything about us. We may say, I'll give you access, Jesus, to 90% of my heart. But you're not going to see that 10% I don't want you to see. But he already sees it. He already knows. He just wants you to share in it with him. It's a relationship. He wants to clean that out. He wants that to be purified. He knows you can't do that by yourself. That's why we need a Savior. We can't fake it, guys. We cannot be something that we are not. We can't pour out love and grace to other people if we haven't sat at the feet of Jesus and received his love. We can't give away what we haven't taken in. The Jews saw Jesus do miracles and they too wanted a miracle. Don't we all want a miracle? There's lots of us praying for a miracle right now from this virus, right? And that's good. There's nothing wrong with praying for a miracle. Jesus still does them. Jesus still does them. You have to look for them. You have to look hard. We talked about last week, listening hard. You have to look hard for the miracles. He's still doing them. But here's the thing. They wanted the miracles without the relationship. Do we want the miracles without the relationship? I think, gosh, that's got to really hurt Jesus. That we want his power and his miracles more than we want him. They wanted to be saved from troubles, but not saved from their own sin. They wanted Jesus to lead them out of trouble and to continue to bail them out. But did they really want a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with Jesus? See, as he rode into Jerusalem, the crowd waved their palm branches, threw their cloaks on the ground, shouted, Blessed be the King who comes in the name of the Lord. It's all Jesus. It's all praise at that point. Cheers, blessings, praises, high fives, giving honor to God for the arrival of Jesus. It's all well when it's going our way and we have no problems, right? It's all good when God is answering our prayers the way we want Him to. I'll serve God when it's going great. I'll serve God when my prayers are being answered the way I want them to. But when Jesus doesn't do exactly what we want him to, then things can change in our heart, can't they? I mean, Jesus rode in on a donkey. Come on, how are you going to ride in on a donkey and defeat the Romans? Jesus chose a donkey to show humility, to show relatability, to show meekness. You know, I kind of picture it like a scene in rush hour traffic. Everybody's rubbernecking to see Jesus, and the further back you are, 
the more you're wondering, what's the delay? Oh, it's Jesus. Okay, I can wait this out a little longer. It's Jesus. He's going to save us from the Romans. Our Redeemer, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And then they get a glimpse of Jesus riding in on the donkey. My Redeemer, what's he doing on a donkey? Where's his chariot? Where's his thoroughbreds? Where's his mighty fighting men surrounding him? Now we've got some cheers fading away. Now we've got some moaning and groaning and complaining. Now, Jesus' popularity with the snap of a finger is waned. Cheers may have stopped. But God's will is still going to be carried out. The people changed on Jesus in a heartbeat. Do we change on Jesus when things quit going our way? When things get uncomfortable? When we don't get the promotion we wanted? When the finances get tight? When... The relationship's not going the way we want it to. If we're honest, sometimes when those things don't go well, our relationship with Jesus changes. Sometimes it takes less than that, right? It takes getting the dinner order wrong. It takes not getting through the stoplight when you're in a hurry. Sometimes a lot less can impact our hearts in a negative way. The people changed on Jesus. But my last point that I'd like to share with you today, the plan of God did not change. The plan of God did not change. See, the cheering may have stopped. The praising may have stopped. You see, they really wanted Jesus to create a riot. That's what they really wanted. But he did not gather an army to fight the Romans, which is what they wanted. He didn't do what they expected him to do, and they jumped ship on him. Jesus knew their hearts. Jesus knew their desires. The cheering stops when we drift away from God and expect him to be something that he's not. The cheers stop when we do not recognize His will and His plan. See, the people of Jerusalem wanted conflict. But Jesus was offering peace in the middle of conflict. People today are not willing to accept Jesus on his terms. We want him on our terms. But following Jesus, and when we study the Bible with people, and we love to do that, we love to get in the Word and help people that don't know Jesus learn more about him. But truth be told, it's good for us to get in the Word and the Bible study too because we learn something new when we get into the Word. And God reveals new things to us, so we're here to learn from one another. But make no mistake, following Jesus is always involved denying ourselves, taking up our cross daily, following Him, hear the Word of God. Because religion without relationship is meaningless. We've got to change. We've got to repent. We've got to reform words that today's society doesn't like. 
People want to see the power of Jesus, but Jesus wants to see a change of heart. I think this is still true, what I'm about to tell you. Maybe it's changed and somebody can make me aware of it, but the largest cross, structured cross, in the United States is found actually not, not too far away from here, about an hour and a half from my house, just, just south of Springfield in a town called Effingham, Illinois. That cross is said to be 198 feet tall. Big cross, wouldn't you say? The largest cross in the world is in Macedonia at 216 feet tall and weighs 180 tons and can stand winds of up to 145 miles an hour. Pretty powerful structure, wouldn't you say? But you know those crosses, do you know what they can do for you without Jesus? Nothing. They're simply a pile of steel. They're simply a structure without the power of Jesus. So let's wrap this up. In one sense, Jerusalem was close to the end of the journey for Jesus. Prophecy was coming true. The perfect plan of salvation was drawing nearer and nearer. Jesus was getting very close to the cross. Close to dying for each one of us. Those that accept Jesus on His terms. He is going to become, at that point, our Savior. For those that reject what He's done... It's a sad day, as one day they will die in their sins. Please don't forget this week what Jesus has done. Please don't forget all that he endured for us. Don't forget his love for us. I'd like to tell you a little, little illustration. There's a story of, uh, of what a guy thinks about his minister. He says, He will take you up to the mountain down to the valleys. He will bring you laughter and to tears. He will have you jumping for joy and then falling on your knees. By the time he is finished, he will bring you to the foot of the cross. That's a nice thing for someone to say about his minister. But I would rather see Jesus bring each one of us to the foot of the cross. You know, Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God, because he who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. I have found that to be true. I know that He is real because my relationship with Him is real. It's not perfect because of me. It's not a perfect relationship because of me. But I know it's real. I know it's authentic. I know He's with me. And I pray and trust that you do too. As we prepare to close, back to our main text, Give me just a second here to get my glasses on. If we go back to Luke 19, verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. 
The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you to the ground and you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone to another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. You know, we don't know how much time we have, do we? Jesus came into Jerusalem a week before the cross, and there is a time coming when Jesus is going to come again. And a lot of people think maybe we're in the middle of end days right now. I don't know. The Bible says we won't know when Jesus returns. We, we won't know the hour and the, the date. So I can't predict it. I'm not going to predict it. Many have tried and all have been proven wrong because he's not back yet, but he is coming. And when he comes, when he comes this time, how will he find our hearts? How will he find our hearts? I think we all need to get back. I think God's trying to use this virus to get us back to the foot of the cross, to get us back on our knees, to get us back desperate for him, to get our priorities realigned with his priorities once again. The Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Is he still Lord of your life? Let's stay connected, brothers and sisters. If you're joining us today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus the way you'd like, I offer my help. You can reach me by phone, by email. I'll give it to you now. My phone number, area code 615-480-6953. Love to study the Bible with you. Love to take you through the scriptures and show you what Jesus teaches about repentance and baptism, forgiveness of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a joy to be with you this morning, to look at Scripture together. I love you all so much. Look forward to our next time together. God bless.